So I'll, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background. And I, I know Jen has prepared some questions. Um, I'm going to kind of share my trajectory into how I became a champion for women, empowering women, and a champion for the underprivileged. A lot of people say I have a unique story. And I'll have you judge for yourself. Uh, I'm a refugee of the Persian Gulf War. Uh, I was my, One of my earliest memories was actually being in a bomb shelter in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein took over tried to invade Kuwait for its oil. I was with my family, my sisters, my brothers, my parents, my neighbors, and uh, there were bombs dropping all around us. And after they subsided, maybe an hour after they subsided, two men burst into the shelter, and they called out my little brother's name. And they came up to us and said, where's Mahmoud Mustafa? You have an hour to pack two bags. We're bringing you to the US. Uh, they asked for him because he had just been born in Philadelphia two months prior. And because he was a U.S. citizen, two U.S. ambassadors actually went to Kuwait to extract them out of the country for their safety and bring them to the United States. I was eight years old at the time, and I didn't speak any English. I didn't know anything about the culture. It was a really, it was an earth-shattering moment, especially even though I was on the plane coming here, I thought somehow we were coming back. I didn't really, it didn't, the gravity of it didn't really sink in until about a few months later after we arrived. And um, that experience uh, has made me an advocate of the birth lottery. Does anybody know what that means, the birth lottery? That term, has anyone ever heard it before? The birth lottery is, um, it's something I think about a lot. It's, it's kind of, it's the, how random our starting point is. You know, like I didn't choose to be born in Kuwait. I didn't choose to be a woman. I didn't choose to be born into an upper middle class family there. I didn't choose the war that happened. And yet all of them shaped how I've become and, and who I am today. And uh, the thing about the birth lottery is that some people are born into a lot more opportunities than others. So part of why I love technology is that technology can kind of tilt balance that scale a little bit. And what I've done with Girl Develop It and Roar for Good, what I'm doing with Roar for Good is all about kind of tilting that balance, making it more equitable. I also grew up in an environment where I was constantly told that women were not equal. Women were less than men. Um, my mom had her marriage arranged for her when she was 16. She met my dad three days before they married when she was 18. And the culture growing up was um, very much focused on my brothers. Uh, my mom was even referred to as uh, my brother's name. It, she, she wasn't referred to by her own name. It was Adam's mother. It, it was always after the firstborn. And I grew up in an environment where it was all about their education, their needs, their desires being fulfilled. So that... I couldn't understand why. <laughs> and uh, that is a big reason of why I founded Girl Develop It, why I've been a part of Tech Girls, Coded by Kids, and why I want to try to inspire women as, as, much a po as much as possible. I didn't really get a chance to be a US citizen until five years ago. Uh, be being a US citizen completely changed my life. Uh, it happened on April 19th, 2012 at 10.39 AM. And uh, it's a very profound moment for me because even though we had been brought over as refugees, something broke down within the immigration system. And when I was 15 applying for colleges, I actually learned I was considered illegal, that I couldn't apply for school, that I couldn't get a driver's permit or a license, that I couldn't get a real job or a loan. And I will, I'll spare you the long story, but it was a really difficult time because I felt like I was kind of on the outside looking in, you know, wondering why the, that nine digit, that, that social security number could hold so much power into what you could do with your life. And when I was 18, I was hit with another whammy. My father decided we were becoming too Americanized, so he actually ended up boarding a one-way flight to Jordan, taking all the family savings with him. So you can think of, I've had a couple starts in life. One is coming over here, two is 18, father leaving with all, all, all the money. And that was when we were thrust in this world of working under the table. Uh, and let me tell you, working under the table is one of the greatest motivators of wanting to be your own boss. 
because uh, these people know they have all the power. They pay you much less than what you deserve. Working double shifts is the norm, and I just remember being 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and looking at them and thinking, one day, I'm going to be a nicer version of you. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of, of, of my background. How I, I got myself into technology was actually an accident. I, was, I went to Temple University. That's where I got my undergrads. Uh, go Owls. And um, when I was there, my very last semester, um, someone referred me to this internship uh, that had to do with working with um, early stage technology companies. Uh, it was basically helping them with their business plans, fundraising, and go to market strategies. And I took the internship on top of my already existing internship and my two part time jobs, and I fell in love with it. Like I sat across from entrepreneurs with these grand dreams, and I wanted to be them. Uh, I didn't know anything about technology, uh, and I, I did that for about three years, learned as much as I could, took a lot of notes. And um, when I was there, I started running the blog so that we could establish ourselves as thought leaders uh, so we can get more clients. And someone told me one day that you could make money while you're blogging. And I was like, making money from something I'm already doing? I'm there. So, uh, so I grew the blog to be one of the top 100,000 blogs on the internet and put some ads up. A couple months later, a few checks came in and I, and I was hooked. Uh, but the, the whole idea of making money blogging was very convoluted. You had to, it was an eight step process to go get an ad, add it to your site, sign up for a program, all that kind of stuff. So I left that to start 123 Linkit. 123 Linkit was my very first company. It was a blog advertising company helping bloggers make money from their content. And the way it essentially worked is if you uh, bought the latest iPhone 7 and you wrote a review about it, we would scan your blog, look for the product keywords, automatically turn it in affiliate link, which um, is basically a hyperlink where if you clicked on it, it would take you right to the product page of that store. And if you bought something, we took a commission. It was acquired two years later uh, by one of my advisors who worked out in Silicon Valley. Um, that gave me financial freedom for the very first time. I took some time off and uh, I went traveling through South America for six months. It was, uh, it was amazing. Uh, it was also because I had just become a US citizen, I could travel for the first time. So I went to Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, spent about a month in each country. It uh, completely changed my life and it actually helped me form Roar for Good. And I know that we're gonna talk about it through one of Jen's questions, so I'll, I'll hold off on and telling you about that. And Girl Develop It, how I found a Girl Develop It is that one, two, three, link it, I found myself as a non-techie running a tech company. And I hired developers, and these developers would come to me and say, I can make it this way or this way. What do you, what, which way you want? What, what do you want me to do? And I'd be like, whatever, I don't know, you tell me. I don't know what you're talking about. It was like they spoke a different language. And as you can imagine, that got me in a lot of trouble uh, because uh, there's uh, many different ways that you can go about tackling uh, a problem and you really had to think further ahead than what I was doing. And I didn't know enough about what I was doing. I, was, I think being, being an entrepreneur is also being very naive. You have to be a little naive to get into entrepreneurship and starting your own business. So, um, so I, uh, I tried to teach myself how to code so that I could converse better with my developers. I could be part of developing the product. Uh, did not do very well. Um, almost threw my laptop out the window. And then I learned why so few women get into technology. And, uh, and then I started Girl Develop It Philadelphia. And uh, Girl Develop It was actually started in New York. I learned about it on Twitter. I took a two hour bolt bus there and back to take a two hour class. And it completely changed my life. I learned how to code. I won't say I'm a developer now, but I learned enough of how tech works that I could actually communicate with, with developers and, and communicate in my respective techno tech fields right now. And uh, it's an amazing organization. It's all about helping young professionals, college students learn uh, technology for the first time. And it's all about uh, learning it in a judgment-free, empowered environment. So the founder started because they found themselves the only women in their tech classes. And when they would raise their hands, they would get heckled. And one of them dropped out. She met other women that had the same experience. So they banded together to start this organization that's very, very focused on um, 
teaching women in a way that makes them inspired, makes them want to get into technology. So I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions before we dive into uh, some with, with Jennifer. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let me get my chair. Yeah, so, um, so during my travels, while I was in South America, um, I really wanted to immerse myself in the culture. And um, I stayed a lot with locals, and I tried to meet as many locals as possible, and I got to know a lot of women. And one of the recurring things that kept happening throughout my travels is I kept meeting women who would share some type of story of how they were attacked or harassed or abused, and it was just never ending. And then a week after I came back, I was living in downtown Philadelphia, 13th and Locust, while my neighbor went out to her car and, um, and she was attacked. And I'll spare, I'll spare the details, but it was a really gruesome incident. And when I read the news story the next day, the idea came about, and, and the idea was, Women use self-defense tools to protect themselves. But what I thought was wrong with them is that you have to pull them out of your pocket or your purse for them to be useful. And it's not like you can be like, wait, hold on, you know, and, and grab it. So what I wanted to do is kind of combine self-defense tools with wearable technology, which is what, what was really hot back then. And uh, the first idea that I had was going to be called the mace lip, mace in a bracelet. And I do love that name. I love that name, but I, I would have been sued by Mace. But, uh, um, but I, I, I started talking to a lot of women doing a lot of user research, and I found out that it was actually a terrible idea, that most women don't like self-defense tools because they're intimidating, that they're worried. The number one fear was that they were going to be overpowered and it used against them as a weapon. So I learned after gathering all this data, went back and came up with Athena. Athena is our first safety wearable tech product, and it's basically um, a pendant that you can wear any which way that you want. And the idea is that um, if you feel anxious or that you're um, in trouble, you can use it to have someone watch over you or to instantly get help. So if you're walking home late at night and you want someone to watch over you, you can tap it three times and it'll send your coordinates to your pre-programmed contacts and they can watch where you are. Um, until you get to your destination. And if you're in, something happens and you're in real trouble, um, you press and hold the button and it sends your coordinates, sounds an alarm, and we're adding a functionality for it to call an emergency number. And the whole idea of Work for Good is we want to just build a product to build a product. Because uh, right now the onus is always on women, like don't go here, don't wear that. Don't wear that. Uh, we wanted to change behavior, we wanted to change uh, um, society's uh, viewpoints on those things, uh, and we are a social impact company, um, or B Corp, meaning that we actually invest the proceeds in empathy education. Because what we've learned is that empathy, lack of empathy, is directly correlated with assault attacks and harassment. And if you teach kids at a, at a young age when they're most impressionable about empathy, you actually can decrease uh, attacks, harassment, and enemies. So we go to different countries with that? So we are currently in pre-order mode. So we've sold out until June. Uh, we're currently about three weeks away from shipping our first batch. Uh, and we've partnered up with organizations that already do empathy education. So we have two partners. One is One Love Foundation and Women Against Abuse. And they go into high schools and college campuses and talk about respect, healthy relationships, and um, can you tell us a little more about the process of bringing your product to market from the technology side? Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really, really hard. I was telling Jessica earlier, it's, uh, it's a lot about taking one step forward, taking two steps back. Uh, manufacturing our product has been very, very different than starting a software company. Um, and uh, I'll just go on a little tangent and say that um, when I was running one two through Link It, I mentioned that as a non techy non techy running a tech company was, was a big challenge. I also don't have any experience in hardware. So running uh, Roar for Good, you might think would be a challenge. One of the things that I've learned in my background is that, or in my, my experience, is that it's not necessarily about knowing everything. 
Uh, it's about knowing what we what you know and finding other people who fill the gaps. So what I've been very lucky in doing is assembling a team that fills in the holes that I don't know. So even though I know nothing about hardware, I know nothing about engineering, I've run and, and created this company. And the idea of taking uh, building a product and taking it to market, it's, um, it involves a lot of talented people that are not me uh, to come together and uh, do a lot of market research uh, 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 for focus groups and learn about what exactly is the problem that we're solving. Uh, we, we were solving the pro problem of making the existing self-defense tools better. And uh, we hired industrial designers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. Uh, we went through many iterations of the product. Um, we did a lot of user testing. Uh, I would say the most helpful I was during that time is I would go to sororities and college campuses and I would stand up and I would tell them my idea and I would ask for feedback. And I would always ask for, what do you not like? Why would you not use it? And in what cases would you want to use it? And that really is what shaped how the product looks, how the product functions. At the very beginning, the product only had an alarm. Uh, there was no silent mode. And the silent mode actually came through all the feedback of getting up and, and asking women, why, why do you not like it? Why would you not use it? And then it's been uh, working with manufacturers um, in terms of, of making it happen. And I don't want to simplify the process. It's really, really difficult. Um, and if anyone has specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Does anyone have a question about that at all? Yeah. When you said you hired industrial engineers and hired so then a capital or something. So how did that, that had to be the first step. Yeah, yeah, so I used initially capital, uh, my own capital, mm -hmm. Sweat Equity, and uh, <laughs> uh, Darla um, has a company called Sweat Equity. Um, and um, so I used a little bit of my own capital and um, friends who were on those industries that, that charged me a little less than in the market rates mm -hmm. to help me get started. And then once I got enough traction, once um, people started hearing about it and talking about it and I started getting press, I went to friends and family and raised a $250,000 round. Uh, it was right before a crowdfunding campaign. So that $250,000 actually helped me build a prototype that worked. Uh, after that, I, I did an Indiegogo campaign, which is equivalent of Kickstarter. It was in late 2015. And that was gonna be the make or break moment for Roar. It was gonna be that, hey, is this gonna work or is this not gonna work? Because we kept hearing, you know, I want this, I want this, but it's a completely different for someone to actually pull out their wallet and their credit card mm -hmm. and buy it. And we used that as market validation. Our goal was to raise 40,000. That was going to be enough to build the mold or the tool that was gonna make Athena. Uh, it actually be, ended up being much more, but, um, but we actually ended up raising 270,000 over the course of 30 days. And once that happened, that was like, okay, we're on to something, let's keep going. And that actually helped us raise a $2 million. Yeah, so um, can you talk a little bit about how you determine who wants to manufacture overseas and uh, what criteria you want to set Yeah, great question. So we are making Athena in China. Right now, I actually just came back from a three-week trip visiting our factory and setting up the assembly line. The reason we went overseas, initially we were going to do it domestically, we were going to make it in California, and it was it was purely down to cost and the type of product that we were making. Um, there are certain products that are more advantageous to make them here. Uh, our product was a little bit more complicated and required certain things that it just made it easier to develop overseas. And our cost of uh, uh, what, actually, uh, they decreased by 50% by going overseas. So that's why we chose to go to China. Yeah. Let's see. A similar question. How did you find the manufacturer? Good question. So um, it wasn't me. It was uh, my team. Uh, my industrial designer actually first referred me to this manufacturer in Taiwan that does small batches. So many manufacturers don't even want to work with you unless you have high volume. So high volume as in like tens of thousands of products. This one manufacturer, their, their max was 3,000. Um, if you had 3,000, they would work with you. They were the exception to the rule. And we found them through the industrial designer because she had worked with them in, in the past. During the crowdfunding campaign, we sold 3,500 devices. 
Uh, so one of the reasons we're actually late is because they couldn't take us on uh, because after one month we sold 3500 and it was way over their quota. So the very first three months um, after the crowdfunding campaign were actually spent vetting and finding another manufacturer. And we're currently a year late in shipping. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, that, was, that was one of the issues. And the second one we found by just talking to people in the industry. Uh, we decided to work with Flex. And the reason we decided to work with them is that they make 90% uh, of today's wearables. So probably many of the wearables that you wear, like the Fitbit, the Apple Watch, uh, actually not the Apple Watch, the, uh, the Apple Mac adapters, um, the uh, Jawbone, the Nike Fuel Band, they've had a hand in, in making a couple of So, uh, and they're considered the first year manufacturer. And uh, they wanted to work with us. So we were like, heck yeah, we want to work with you. So that's, uh, that's how we got the one. It took me three and a half months. It was really fine. What are your sales today? If you don't mind me asking. Um, about 700,000. So, because technology gets obsolete so quickly, um, and you had, you know, somewhat of a delay with manufacturing, and there's always these questions about whether or not you've got a patent and someone's going to steal it. How do you kind of keep and evolve when you're, you know, in this, you know, sort of start, you know, like the start stop and, and you're trying to build up the volume and the, the excitement and get people behind your product? It is such a great question. It is such a great question. It's a huge challenge when you're building your product because whatever you actually launch with, uh, the technology will be so much better that exists at that time. And that has been an issue where we've had, uh, I don't want to say an issue, a challenge that we face to where we'll see that there's a new chip that, that can do this and that, but we've already committed to one th this one chip and tested it. and and. Um, <laughs> And uh, one of the things that we realize is that if we keep looking at what's new and wanting to change it, we'll actually never launch. Uh, but what we do is we use, we stay on top of the latest trend so that we can see what we can do to build future better products. One of the things that we wanted to do with Athena early on was actually add a camera and a microphone so that if you activate it, that, and, and, you know, and it calls someone, they can see where you are, they can hear what you're doing. Uh, in, in the user testing that we did, once we well, once we started building it, it actually came out to be like like a flavor flavor type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> like it was huge. It was huge. And I would say now that it's been two years later, it's probably half the size of that, but still pretty bulky. And what we have to do is compromise between the technology that exists and the solutions and the wants of our target markets. So balancing those have, have helped us stay stay on track. And, but we're excited for the future because right. where we see future devices going is actually embedding it right into your, your clothing. So having a belt that you don't even know that it's a, a little button that you can press to get help or yoga pants that you know have something at the top that you can activate to try to get help, stuff like that. It's amazing how far the technology has come in the last few years. Any other questions? You mentioned that you're a B Corp. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you talk about your decision to become a B Corp and how that impacts your supply chain and whatnot? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, anybody know what B Corp is? No. No? So, being a, key, a, B, a B Corp is a, a company entity. So, instead of like being a LLC or, or S Corp, it's, um, it's be a key B Corp means that you're a for profit company taking into mind not just profitability but the environment and the community. So it's a, a triple bottom line. And, um, and we really wanted to do that because we didn't want to just be a company building products. Like, I really truly believe that we can make the world a safer place. And I don't want to just say it, I want to embody it in, in, in everything that we do. And how it's impacted our supply chain is, so for example, our packaging uh, is 99% recyclable. Uh, in terms of vetting our manufacturer, one of the things that we looked at is do they use, you know, what type of labor do they use? How fair are their practices? One of the things that we're doing um, after these first uh, 12,500 units is we are looking at switching our battery. So finding lithium batteries that are ethically sourced is really difficult. So your, your Apple iPhone right now, the cobalt that's in the batteries was probably an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old in Congo probably went into a mine and, and pulled that out to create those those batteries. 
we don't we don't want to be involved in that. So the next run out, we found ethically sourced batteries so that we we know they can be traced to where the labor is. Uh, it's people being uh, uh, treated fairly and they're safe in what they're doing. Uh, but we think about it all the time um, in the environment, in the community, in everything that we do at the company. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What was the hardest part? The hardest part of getting Athena to market. Well, it's right now trying to ship. <laughs> uh, I would say um, we. So we're a year late due to uh, a few reasons. One is the manufacturer having to find a new one. I would say one of the mistakes that I have made has been working with contractors instead of bringing employees on. I thought that I would be scrappy and instead of hiring people as, as uh, employees, I'd uh, hire contractors to help me um, because it'd be cheaper. Uh, and what I found out is that it's actually more expensive because contractors have other clients that they're working on, other projects, so we're not top of mind all the time. And uh, there have been a few projects where we've started, uh, finished, and had to restart and finished uh, and finish again, so that has been probably one of my biggest learning points. Um, and I would say it has definitely set us back. Uh, one area of that is a mobile app. Um, when we built the mobile app, we hired, I actually hired a friend of mine who built it on top of technology, a, a platform that he created. And um, that made us tied to his technology. So when we found somebody else, uh, it took a lot of time to redo everything and get started again. So, um, so I would say that that's definitely been one one challenge that if I could go back, I would I would change. Um, other challenges? Um, oh my God, there's so many. I don't know where to start. Um, I I definitely had at the very beginning. Um, there were so many people that were passionate about what we were doing that I, we started working together without really uh, finalizing our agreement with each other in terms of. Um, equity especially. There was this one industrial designer, the very first one, uh, three months uh, after we started working together, he thought he was a co-founder. And I was like, whoa, where did this come from? And uh, it was a really difficult um, ordeal where we had to sit down and have very uncomfortable conversations. And um, I actually had to get a lawyer involved. and. Uh, and my lesson learned there is uh, deal with all the financial stuff at the very beginning and don't, uh, you know, don't have any confusion come up later. Um, so those were, those were some that I could think of off the top of my head. And then what advice would you have for someone who wants to start their own startup or small company? Sure, yeah. I would say um, a lot of the, the, the women that I meet um, <coughs> think they have to know everything. Um, even my girl develop it. Um, you know, once, once um, we had the students coming in, learning how to code, learning about databases, learning about mobile, mobile technology, they wouldn't go and apply for the jobs unless they met 90 or 100% of the criteria. And actually studies show that uh, guys, once they meet like 60% of the criteria, they'll go and apply for, for the job. And, and I've noticed the same thing in starting a business, that they feel like they have to know much more than they do and really, um, it's just it's finding the right team and filling in the gaps, as I, as I talked about earlier. I would say that's, that would be one of my, my top ones. It would also be um, getting mentors. Uh, I've been very, very lucky in that I've been involved in the community long enough that I have a group of people that I trust and I go to uh, with every challenge that I face. When I had the industrial designer that I didn't know what to do, I went to my advisor said, tell me what to do, I have no idea. I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, my company's gonna shut down before it even starts. And uh, they helped me uh, work through it. And uh, yeah. And then, do you think technology is one of your passions? Why do you think it's one of your passions? Sure, yeah, so um, I think technology today um, you know, technology is helping blind people see. It's helping uh, deaf people hear. It's helping people walk again. And there is so much that you can do 
with hardware and software to help people. Uh, and that's why I, I, I love it. I also love it in that I believe that that's what's going to shift uh, the wage gap um, so that it decreases. Uh, because right now, there are more tech jobs than there are, or there will be in 2020, more tech jobs than people will fill them. And having, uh, um, having that is going to create a lot of opportunities for women in terms of uh, getting more money, in terms of having a flexible working schedule, in terms of having more freedom um, in the workplace. So that's why I get excited about it. Yeah, great question. Yeah, during the crowdfunding campaign, we had a, a, a lot of outreach um, of different ideas that you can use Athena for that we didn't really quite think about too too much. So one of them was um, parents that won it for their disabled children or their children overall, parents that won it for their own parents uh, as an alternative to Life Alert, um, people with medical conditions. We've had hospi hospitals reach out to see what they could do in terms of um, how we can work together. Um, so there's been many more applications than we even dreamed of at the beginning. And it's actually what helped us raise our $2 million round is showing investors that this can be applied in, in many different ways. Um, lately, it's been a lot of outreach from the LGBT community, um, Muslim women who wear hijabs. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different ways that, that you can take it, absolutely. Yes? Your story and your purpose are so, um, like, they're so all encompassing in that, like, you come from a place where you understand what the struggle, like, the women, like, the struggle of being a woman and being potentially being at risk for these trauma, like, traumatic events. And I can understand how you want to do so much good, especially, like, if you're traveling to South America and then, like, Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I definitely have ADD, <laughs> um, and it's hard for me to sit still. Uh, so um, we get an email probably at least once a day from someone who has been attacked or abused. Um, we get a lot of outreach from, especially lately in the last uh, couple months, from people who are in fear, and um, I will say those have helped me stay more focused than ever. Yeah, because it's, it's amazing how what people will share with you that you don't even know. And, um, and there's been, and, and there's been some, some really traumatic. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, so, so good question. Those emails um, are, are what inspire me to stay focused. And, and it is difficult because there's so many different ways that we can take it, but I know by, but by staying focused, I can get to that dream faster and quicker and then move on to other things. I think there was a question back here. Can you comment on uh, Philadelphia as a place for startups and maybe some other regions in the States and why you chose there? Yeah, sure, yeah. So um, I chose Philadelphia because my family's in Philadelphia. <laughs> when I was traveled for six months, I really gained an appreciation to wanting to be by my family when I came back uh, so that wherever they go, I'm going to go. Um, so it's not the normal answer that you hear, but Philadelphia is very startup friendly town. Um, it's uh, the cost of living is much cheaper than living in New York or DC or of course uh, Silicon Valley. Um, it's very close to all those areas, New York, DC, Baltimore, so it's um, even Boston, so it's really easy to get to in different places if you need to. Um, there have been more tax incentives recently, which is fantastic. There's also a lot of talent. Uh, so I think within a 50-mile radius of Philadelphia, there are 100 universities. So there's a lot of great 
talents that, talent that you can source from. Um, and lately, the Keystone areas where you can get tax breaks have been pretty, um, like I know we could take advantage of it next year and I can't wait. Uh, so, and the community is really growing. Like when I first started in technology, I guess it was uh, 2006. So, whoa, 11 years ago. Uh, wow, I feel so old saying that. Um, it was really scattered and isolated as an entrepreneur. Like you didn't really get to know many other entrepreneurs like you. And then Philly Startup Leaders formed. And Philly Startup Leaders is a great nonprofit organization that is for entrepreneurs to help them either get into the field or uh, learn about different challenges in, in the business. Um, a great place to find mentors too, by the way. Um, they, um, they now run events pretty much a few nights a week, whereas it used to be once a month. So it's really, uh, it's really flourished in the, last, in the last few years. Yeah, great question. Um, so with Girl Development and Tech Girls and Coded by Kids, we talk about that a lot. And um, a big part of it is, I would say, the media and also how we treat children. Uh, you know, the media portrays um, men as being the technologists. Uh, and they show tech, tech roles as you're in a basement, in a dark room, in front of a computer, coding away. And that's just not the way it is. Uh, and also, um, in school and in everyday life, you know, one of the things I've noticed is we tell little girls they're beautiful and cute, and we'll tell boys they're brave or and smart. So the way we speak to them carries on uh, as they get older. And uh, what research has found is that girls tend to get away from technology in middle school. And it's partially because they don't see themselves in those roles, because they see men fulfilling those roles and they don't think they're smart enough to get into those roles, or they're told that it's not for them, that they should go into fashion or, or something else. Uh, so um, those, those are the things that, that I've noticed. Okay, thank you very much.